Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the February 18th meeting of the Citizen Oversight Board. We are um, really excited about today's meeting, uh, in part because we are welcoming a new board member. Um, Larry Martinez uh, was approved by council, I think, last week um, after an accidental delay. So we're thrilled that you're here. Hope you had a nice vacation um, preceding this because uh, the, the work's about to start. So um, Larry, I don't know if you want to say anything um, about yourself or your interest in the board, but that might be a nice introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Larry. Um, honored and, and happy to be here and uh, contribute any way that I can. Um, born and raised in uh, Denver, Colorado. I've worked for Denver Inner City Parish for the past 20 years. Um, and uh, Denver Inner City Parish, just really quickly, is a nonprofit human service organization um, that's been serving Denver um, since 1960. Um, and even before that, I've always um, had an interest in uh, my community from when I'd attend coalition meetings with my dad as a kid to growing up in the weed and seed program and a whole bunch of other things. Um, so happy to be here and happy to connect with anyone offline one-on-one uh, -on -one as well. Thanks so much. Thrilled to have you. Um, a couple of other quick board business matters. Uh, first, uh, thank you to anyone who's uh, attending our meeting today. Uh, who attended the community forums we held earlier this week. Um, we had uh, somewhere along the lines of 120 community members attend those two events um, and uh, eight to 10 community organizations, depending on uh, how you count it. We had a couple of folks representing multiple organizations, but uh, I thought really great questions and um, uh, good dialogue with the candidates. So really excited about that. Um, in terms of next steps, uh, the candidates have one more city uh, internal stakeholder meeting next week. And our public facing feedback form will be available until Sunday. And we are keeping the video that um, community members can watch at any time available till Sunday as well. Um, so our hope is that folks get their feedback into us, um, you know, before the holiday um, and we can coalesce as a board both on that feedback and then we'll be meeting to discuss um, uh, our perspectives on the candidates performance in those forums as well as um, their interaction with uh, public safety members and others who um, they've been meeting with throughout the week so um, lots of good discussion to come um, Daniel do we have a date for that meeting yet I can't remember Apologies, uh, I don't. No, I don't have it off the top of my head. Sorry. Okay. Um, is it scheduled, or we're still scheduling it? I think we're still scheduling it. Okay. Perfect. So uh, more to come on that, um, and board members look out for an invitation from Daniel um, on that. Um, the next thing is just approval of the board minutes. Um, if folks had a chance to review those, um, and if there are no changes. Um, May I have a motion to approve them? Oh. Thank you. A second? Second. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Thank you. Oh, April, I liked your um, computer hand raise. That's very good. Thank you. Um, okay. So I think that is all the board business. Um, that we have. Um, Daniel, anything you want to say about um, the annual report or do you want to talk about that um, in executive session? Uh, I think most of it's going to be an executive session, uh, but we are getting close uh, and the board is going to have its uh, opportunity to provide its sort of official board ratings after having reviewed uh, OIM's performance data and uh, survey information uh, after this meeting. So, Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, with that, we will turn it over to our guest today, uh, Sheriff Elias Diggins. Um, it has been no doubt a busy week for you um, in terms of uh, public media attention. Um, so certainly we'd like to talk about 
uh, that if possible um, and to the degree possible. We also sent some questions over uh, to you, your office sheriff. And so if you have had a chance to get answers to those, if you wouldn't mind uh, reading the question and then providing the answer as part of your um, opening comments, that would be great. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm not sure if you want me to cover the events of the past week and a half first. I know they are at the bottom of the list of questions that I have. So I didn't know if you want me to address them first or just uh, take those as they're listed. Yeah, how you'd like, however you'd like is good. Okay, I'll just go right down the list. Uh, the first category that uh, you all sent questions for has to do with our crisis response team. And this is a brand new unit inside the Denver Sheriff's Department that is very similar to the STAR program. We have mental health practitioners who are Denver Sheriff's employees that are working side by side with our deputies uh, throughout both jails. Uh, they started at the beginning of the year with standing up that team and actually launched their efforts on February 7th. Uh, the first question is what still needs to be done to complete the team's rollout? The supervisor for that team uh, is currently being filled. There is an offer being made to a candidate um, and hopefully that person will accept that position. And for the downtown detention center team, we have filled almost all of the positions with one remaining. So we're looking forward to filling that last position, but they've already hit the ground running and have been doing good work Phase two of that launch will be uh, the county jail team and Dr. Johnson, our chief of mental health services, will begin to do that uh, very shortly in the next few months as well. Uh, the second question is when are mental health concerns handled by DSD mental health practitioners and when are they referred out to Denver Health? Generally, when issues revolve around medication or folks needing to have uh, some additional medication, we pivot to the Denver Health team because our team are, are not licensed to provide medication. Your son is out. Uh oh, Nikki, I don't know if. Uh, just texted. Nikki, you're not on mute. Maybe um, Daniel, if we wouldn't mind throwing her on mute, that'd be good. Thanks. So when, when medication needs uh, happen, uh, we pivot to the Denver Health team when we have things such as uh, an M1 hold that needs to be placed on a person. That's when we pivot to the Denver Health team. But generally, that team is going to be able to handle the majority of those concerns. But they also, at any time, uh, when they feel like they need to bring on the Denver Health team, will do so. I'll tell you, we've been working collaboratively with Denver Health uh, as long as I've been on the department for 28 years. They do a great job in this space and just think that the addition of the crisis response team is going to bolster our efforts with providing those services to the, the people that are in our custody. So I'll pause for just a moment uh, to answer any additional questions. Questions from board members on those answers. Okay, seeing none. Next is the criminal charges filing team. Uh, the third question is, we'd like to learn a little more about the criminal charges filing team highlighted in the new action plan. Is it already active? Can you give us an overview of this initiative? The team has not launched. However, we have selected the sergeant and the deputies that are going to be a part of this unit. For as long as I've been with the department, we've always had to call the Denver police officer off the streets to file criminal charges when offenses happen in our custody. And for a number of years, folks like the Fraternal Order of Police, uh, Mayor Hancock, as well as other folks in the Sheriff's Department and Safety have thought about what can we do to move forward with changing uh, the way that that's happening. And the stars aligned with us bringing on people in our organization who had previously done this work. As many of you may recall, uh, we hired Chief Vince Line who has served with the Arapahoe County Sheriff's Department before he came here uh, and worked his way up through the ranks, as well as Major Jacob Ruiz, who came from the Sheriff's Department in Florida, who both have a background in working on the streets and being detectives and overseeing bureaus of that nature. And so knowing that we have staff inside the Denver Sheriff's Department who are either post-certified or post-eligible, uh, 
The mayor thought it was a great time for us to address the fact that we need to ensure that police officers are staying on the street. Director, our former director of safety, Murphy Robinson, uh, also thought it was a great time for us to do this. And uh, together, all of us sat down and came up with a plan for how this could be executed. And so that team has been selected. We're uh, in the process of sending them to post academies for those that aren't already post certified. And hopefully this fall, they'll all have graduated and we'll be able to move forward with the Denver Sheriff's Department now filing our own charges. I'll pause for a moment. Julia, I see you have a question. Yeah, I have, I have two questions actually. Um, the first question is, are there other cities that do this and, or, you know, jurisdictions that do this? Uh, and if so, how does that work for them? What results do they have? Um, are there metrics that we can point to in terms of this being an effective practice? Well, generally what you have is most sheriff's departments are traditional law enforcement agencies, which means you have a patrol function and you have a detention function and they work under the same umbrella. As you all are uh, aware, the sheriff's department does not perform patrol that's done by the Denver Police Department. So in most sheriff's departments uh, across the nation where jails are a part of the work that they do, they already have deputies that are post certified that work in the jail that can perform these functions. So for us, it's uh, moving forward with knowing that we have the skills and ability to perform uh, that ability or to perform that function uh, as a part of the work that we're going to be doing going forward. Okay, so in our case, it's that they're uh, artificially separated and we're trying to build more connection, sounds like. Uh, generally speaking, yes. Okay, and then the next question is like, how do you avoid a game of telephone um, in this case where an, you know, an officer comes in and says like, here's kind of what happened and then they tell somebody and then that person like kind of says, here's kind of what happened, right? Like how do you maintain sort of integrity of information with um, now an additional party involved in that process um, who maybe wasn't doing, you know, didn't show up on the scene, didn't you know, engage uh, you know, victims directly, that kind of thing. Um, like how does that actually work? Well, it will work the same way that it does now. I mean, these deputies won't be working on the floor. This will be their primary function. So they'll be essentially working as investigators for when offenses occur. And the unit will be overseen by not just the sergeant, but also a chain of command who will ensure that there is quality control with the work that they're doing. And the charges will be filed directly with the district attorney's office who will ensure that the cases are sound as well. So for us, it's really about who's doing the work and the work will continue to be the way it'll continue to be done the way that it is today. The difference is instead of a police officer doing the work, it's going to be a deputy sheriff and the quality assurance will be done through checks and balances with the DA reviewing the case as well as those administrators inside of our department reviewing it as well. And I see Stefan and um, Nikki one, one more follow up question. Can you just clarify the scope? So these charging officers will only charge for offenses that have occurred within the jail or, okay. Correct, inside the jail or perhaps at the courthouse. And these are minor offenses. These won't be higher level crimes. So if a sex assault or a very serious uh, injury occurs to someone, we'll still pivot to the Denver Police Department and those detectives to take care of those offenses. Generally, that doesn't happen. Uh, in the facilities that we oversee. Those are handled uh, by the police department and they uh, will continue to do so. Thank you. Stefan? Um, uh, you're still on mute, sir. You're right about that, sir. <laughs> uh, the question Julia just asked is the one that I was gonna ask in terms of scope. I mean, I, I'm, I'm from Los Angeles and you know, the, sheriffs, <clears throat> the sheriffs there have a, a broader, much broader law enforcement function um, in unincorporated areas. And this was very new to me here, um, where the you know, sheriff's jurisdiction was, was limited. So I was, I was gonna ask the exact same question Julie did, but I wanna follow up on that. When you say that the scope of uh, the enforcement function for the sheriffs will be at the jails and, and at the courthouse, but only minor, only, what, what criteria is, uh, will be implemented to have that demarcation line between 
what charges a sheriff and the sheriff's deputies can bring versus what you're still going to rely on the police department. It's about the offense type. If there are serious bodily injury or uh, higher level felonies that occur, we want to pivot to the Denver Police Department. Generally, those aren't the things that happen in our custody or in the facilities that we oversee. So we're talking about very simple minor crimes, simple assaults, uh, contraband issues, things of that nature. For those higher level crimes, we'll ensure that we uh, call in the Denver Police Department to take care of those offenses. I see. And I'm picking up on Nikki's question in the chat. So what types of things have you done in the past and have you referred to DPD on the more on felonies, more serious charges? What sort of things have you have you referred to DPD in, this, in these circumstances? The Denver Police Department has always filed charges uh, for offenses that happen in any facility under the Sheriff's Department's jurisdiction. So it, we have never filed charges on our own. This is right. a brand new unit and a brand new process that's being stood up by our department. And it's not only supported by Mayor Hancock and the Department of Safety, but also the District Attorney Beth McCann and also the City Attorney Kristen Bronson. So all those folks have been involved in the conversation and the process for standing this up. So this is brand new. Uh, we look forward to standing this team up. It gives deputy sheriffs another opportunity to do something different uh, in their careers as well. How big will the team be? I know you said you've you got the leaders identified yeah we have we'll have a team of five deputies that will be a part of this team uh, working 24 hours seven days a week and they'll be overseen by a sergeant as well the sergeant will report to the captain of court services and then it just goes up from there the major the chief and then uh to myself if those deputies aren't sorry i won't dominate this any further if those deputies aren't busy full time, the five deputies, will they have other functions uh, on behalf of the Sheriff's Department? Yeah, they can help out with other duties like giving breaks, things of that nature. But primarily what they are going to be responsible for is responding to those offenses and reviewing reports, things of that nature. One of the things that uh, we're going to do is make sure that there's one deputy on 24 hours, seven days a week. So there'll be other things that they can help out with, but their, their primary function will be to focus on making sure that we're doing this right. Sheriff, I'm trying to get at the volume of arrests you anticipate making. Um, five full-time deputies seems like a lot, given how understaffed the department is. And uh, I'd love to see some numbers for how many times you've had DPD officers have to come in, especially just for those types of uh, assaults or arrests um, that you would take over in the future? And again, in 2021, there was an average of about 13 times per month that this occurred. But here's the other thing that we know. Uh, those charges are generally uh, driven by deputies saying, I want to have charges filed or a person in custody who's perhaps been assaulted saying the same thing. Uh, we've had instances where deputies were hesitant to do so because they know that it's going to either take a police officer off the street to have those charges filed or it may take a long time for that to happen. So we're going to keep metrics on how often that's going to occur. One of the things that we also know is we've got to work on retention in our department and this gives deputies another great opportunity to do something different in their careers. So while we're balancing out the, the number of deputies that we currently have, we also know that we have to do more to give deputies an opportunity to do different things in order to retain good people. We believe that this, uh, this does that as well. I saw a question in the chat. Let me see if I can open that up. Do you think this could add to the lack of confidence from the community? and how the sheriff department treats inmates. Um, Larry, I don't think so. I think what we know is uh, we're working hard to ensure that every single person who is a part of our department leads with humanity. We want every single person in our custody to be, custody to be treated with dignity and respect. Charges are already being filed uh, for folks that are in our custody. This just changes who's filing the charges. So this action is already occurring. It's just the sheriff's deputies are gonna be doing it instead of the Denver police officers. Okay, thank you. And let me see if I've answered all the other questions in that. Sheriff, 
I have some more questions on this topic. I'm okay. wanting to understand, uh, are, so are the arrests that uh, can be made only, say, violations of Denver laws that I might get arrested for out on the street? Or what is to prevent an incident in which an inmate has a grievance about how they're being treated in the jail and the deputy says, oh, well, you know, I saw you sort of being a little physical with the guy next door yesterday. If you file that grievance, I think I'm going to need to file and I'm going to need to arrest you. Like, how do we prevent the intimidation of our citizens who are incarcerated, considering that you're going to be having, I don't know, if there are only 13 arrests being made right now and five full-time employees, that's two per person per month, they're, they're going to need extra work. The volume sounds like it's going to go up. I'm really worried about intimidation. Well, Nick, we have measures in place to ensure that we uh, don't have intimidation happening. Number one, it's not tolerated inside of our agency. Uh, number two, people that are in custody have different ways to file grievances. As you know, we have the grievance and incident response team that oversees those. Third, they have the Office of the Independent Monitor for whom they can file anonymous grievances as well. But let me back up just a little bit. The deputies that are going to be filing the charges are going to do um, a, a workup on each of these instances where things happen. So they'll be interviewing the person who's uh, being charged as well. And generally what you'll see is these are assaults that may happen from person to person. And the person who's being assaulted has to be the person to file the charges. They can't just see two inmates fighting and the deputy say, I wanna have that person charged. The person who was assaulted has to be willing to file the charges as well. So I think there's gonna be a checks and balances by the internal mechanisms that we have with folks that are in our custody to ensure that that doesn't happen. But also, it, it, I don't think that that's gonna be something that's going to happen with the, the deputies that are working in the pots today. They're, they're not gonna say um, that they're using this as an intimidation factor. This is gonna be a sound process that's overseen by the leadership inside the sheriff's department, as well as the folks that are in safety as well. So you said that you have metrics to prevent intimidation. Could you share with the board, you know, what those metrics are and what they, you know, what the historical numbers have been, and then uh, going forward, continue to share those regularly? I believe I said we have measures in place to prevent intimidation. And those measures are the fact that folks in custody can file grievances. They have the uh, ability to contact the independent monitor and other ways that they can ensure that they're not being in intimidated while they're in custody. So I think those are the, the measures that are in place to prevent folks that are in custody from being intimidated. So if someone files a grievance or complaint and the GERT team either looks at it first or HID triages it, there's no chance it's gonna fall out of the system before it gets to the independent monitor? <laughs> Say that one more time. So you're saying that sort of the checks and balances are that GERT's gonna be looking at this, the independent monitor's gonna be looking at this. I'm, I'm wanting to understand because there's triage happening at both of those levels. If there are circumstances where a complaint might fall out of the process before it gets to the OAM and GERT because that would sort of diminish the effectiveness of those checks and balances. No, Nikki, I don't believe that that's gonna happen and we have we don't have any uh, information that says that that has happened um, in our processes. We believe in our processes and believe that they're pretty sound and trust uh, both the GERT and the OIM when it comes to overseeing those grievances. Uh, Stefan, I think I see your hand was up and then Julia's hand was all right after that and then Karen. Just, just wanted to follow up on that. If it's Thirteen, approximately, you said, Sheriff, 13 times per month that you've been engaging these referrals. What, approximately what number of those 13 are uh, complaints or charges that want to want to be made by inmates versus complaints or charges that, that a sheriff's deputy wants to bring? Stephen, I, mean, I'll, I can get that information to you. I'll have our data team uh, research that and, and we'll send that back over to you all. Okay, thank you. And the five full-time employees, they're not there all the time, right? Because you're staffing us 24 seven. 
how many people, how many deputies to be, uh, you know, on a particular shift, for example, to be addressing, you know, it, issues like this. One or two along with the leadership, not all five, right? No, not all five. If you think about the way that our staffing is, we're a 24 seven operation. So we have what we generally call two sides of the week, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So they'll be on either side of the week uh, and we'll make sure that we have coverage around the clock for those things to happen. Okay, all right, thanks, Sheriff. Uh-huh, Julia? Yeah, thanks. Um, just a question on uh, p current policy. I'm not familiar, but um, is intimidation of inmates, uh, in fact, a policy violation? Um, is that a stated policy that you can't do it? And then would it be a violation of that policy if you did do it? Absolutely. It would be a violation of several of our policies and that person would be put through uh, an internal investigation and brought before uh, a hearing panel that would include a member of the monitor's office as well for a disposition. And then I think, Karen, I saw your hand last. All right. Um, Sheriff, can you give an example of the types of charges that uh, in the past have been charged, have been handled by uh, DPD that's now handled by your deputies? Sure, if we have someone who is in possession of contraband, uh, that would be something that would be handled by our deputies. Um, if there is a simple assault where someone punches someone, um, that would be handled by our deputies. So it would be those very simple infractions that are handled uh, by our staff versus DPD. And then Katina, I see your hand. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Um, I also, I just put it in the chat. I apologize to ask you to repeat this, but could you just um, remind us again of the impetus for this change, like how this came about? Sure, for a number of years, the Sheriff's Department has always uh, believed that we're a law enforcement agency. And traditionally, no other law enforcement agency has to ask another law enforcement agency to come in to file charges. And we believe that we have the, the training and the background uh, for this to occur. And also the folks with the experience inside of our agency now with bringing on people that have done this work in the past. Chief Line, uh, like I said, came from Arapahoe County, worked on the streets, was a detective, an investigator, and oversaw a bureau that filed charges, as did Major Ruiz. And when we're talking about ways to streamline uh, the Department of Safety Services as a whole, every time a Denver police officer has to come into the jail to file charges, they're out of service for at least an hour to do so. There's a lot of paperwork that has to happen. They have to lock up, come into the jail. There's a lot that has to happen in order for uh, a police officer to come in and file charges. So as a law enforcement agency, um, we know that the Denver Sheriff's Department has the skill and ability for this to happen. So the stars align. The mayor has been behind this for a number of years. Ever since he was a councilman, he always asked the question, how come we haven't done this? And when Director Robinson came on board, he also looked at it. The Fraternal Order of Police have been behind this for a number of years. And in looking at moving our department forward, I also agree, now is the time for us to move forward with putting a team like this into place. It's gonna be beneficial for the Denver Police Department because they no longer have to pull a police officer out of service. To the Denver Police Department today is 150 police officers down. And every time a police officer has to come off the street to come into the jail to file charges for another law enforcement agency, they're not out where they could be preventing crime or responding to crimes as well. We just believe that this is something that is beneficial to the sheriff's department, to the police department, and the community as a whole. There's a huge benefit to the community because those police officers will stay on the street instead of coming to the jail to file charges. And we have the ability to stand this team up and to do a good job with a lot of checks and balances in place. Thanks, Sheriff. Um, just one follow up. Um... I know there's been a request for a lot of data and, and frankly, we probably need to move on. But um, my last question is just um, when you share data, could you share with us, um, you know, the plans for preparing this team, training this team, um, you know, having them ready to do this, this new role within your department? 
Absolutely. And Katina, just very briefly, I'll tell you, every single person on this team will be post-certified, meaning that they have gone through a post-certified academy. Additionally, there will be training with the district attorney's office, the city attorney's office, with the detectives in the Denver Police Department that have already done this. And they'll also be shadowing deputies in other jails who are performing these duties as well. But I'll be more than happy to share the plan, the overall plan with you all uh, when I send that information over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheriff. Mm -hmm. All right, next. Oh, just one more thing before we sort of close out. Um, sure. So I'm trying to think of how to say this, but the driving impetus for this is to keep cops on the streets. So the outcome we're looking for is more police availability. The impact of this might in fact be you know, racking up charges on folks who are already in your custody, um, right? Because now we've got more people looking at that problem. And I think, you know, at least from my perspective, people need to follow the rules of engagement in the jail. And if we've got more people looking for a problem, there's gonna be more problem, right? Um, it's just, you know, if you're sitting on a shift for 40 hours a week, not much to do, right? You're going to try and find something to do. Um, and so I, I just have concerns about, you know, the outcome we're looking for is more police availability and the impact we might have is, you know, just this substantial list of charges that are, um, you know, carried against people who are already um, in custody. Um, and, you know, that doesn't necessarily make the jail safer. It doesn't make the, you know, like it doesn't have sort of operational metrics for you all or um, necessarily protect people who are in custody might, you know, continue the chain of criminalization. So um, I think the board is keenly aware, at least I'm keenly aware and interested in the metrics uh, of this, right? If we're starting to see, you know, tons and tons of charges filed compared to where we are today, I think, um, you know, we'd like to dig into that a little bit more um, in the future. So, and then, you know, on, on the other side of the coin, just making sure that the inmates in this case, you know, have no power, right? And in order to get um, complaints investigated, they have to have a successful complaint, right? And so they're in a powerless position that requires other action. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we're just, kind of concerned about the imbalance of power and the impact versus the outcome we're looking for here. Um, so, you know, I, th I think you can just expect us to, to dig into this a little bit more um, in the future as, as this rolls out. Well, I appreciate that, Julie. You know, one of the things that we uh, do is keep a lot of data in the Sheriff's Department. So we will be keeping data on the number of charges that are going to be filed by our staff. We welcome a review by the Citizens Oversight Board uh, for that information and look for your recommendations and uh, your opinion on how you believe things are going. So we look forward to that in the coming months uh, once we get the, the team stood up. What I would also like to say is I don't believe that the people that are in our custody are, are uh, in a powerless position. I think they have the ability, even when those charges are filed, to defend them. I mean, they have public defenders. I know Dimitri Hill and her team and the rest of the public defenders are folks that do a phenomenal job. So even if someone is charged with an offense, um, they have someone who's going to be representing them. And I would just say, uh, let's, let, let's see how things go uh, in the coming future and continue to have great conversations like this. When it comes to this work, we believe that it's going to be beneficial to the community, to the police department and the sheriff's department um, and standing up that team and, and welcome your review of that as well. And, and hopefully um, it, it, it will become something that you all uh, believe has been a good change for the Sheriff's Department. Karen, I see your mic is unmuted. I don't know if you have something additional that you'd like to add. Oh, I don't, I'm sorry. Okay, that's all right. Just wanted to make sure. All right, I'll move on to the scaling up of the MAP program. Qu question number seven, does scaling up refer to the number of people in the program? the amount of programming available to participants, budget growth, or, or other aspects of the program. Scaling up does refer to us 
uh, hopefully being able to increase the number of people that are participating in the programming, uh, the amount of programming available, and budget growth. One of the things that we know is that addiction sometimes drives crime. And for a lot of the people that come into our custody, that's exactly what is occurring in their lives. Uh, medicated assisted treatment programs are something the Sheriff's Department has participated in for a number of years. And in looking across the country, we know that increases in MAT availability is going to help us to break the cycles of recidivism. For us, it's about what can we do more to help the folks that are in our custody that have addictions and creating a, uh, an additional MAP program with the MAP pod by specifically focusing on folks' addiction while also providing additional counseling, treatment, and uh, connection to services we believe is going to help the people that it, are in our custody. What's being done to support this goal is the eighth question. Uh, we're standing up a group that's going to be looking at that. That includes internal stakeholders from the Sheriff's Department, myself, Chief Line, and Dr. Nikki Johnson, as well as folks from Denver Health um, and their team to figure out what it looks like to create a MAP pod. You know, we have other pods for mental health um, transition units, recovery in a secure environment, which is more so about alcohol and other addictions where folks are and peer-led programs. This is another program that we're looking forward to exploring inside the Sheriff's Department to hopefully help. There's a lot of addiction, a lot of uh, opioid abuse that's happening in the community and folks coming into our custody have the same thing. So we're hoping to, to do this to help them out. Julia, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I was happy to see this in the, sad that we need this and happy to see that we're doing something about it um, in, in terms of the mayor's plan. We met with Denver Health in December and this wasn't at all something they mentioned, right? We were like, don't we want to do more about MAT? And they were like, yeah, yeah, we're kind of doing it. So like, talk to us a little bit about where you are in this. Like, have you had one meeting um, and we're going in a direction or like, do you have a strategy and a plan? Like how far into, you know, getting this set up are you? The meeting, the first meeting is actually going to happen next week. And Denver Health wasn't talking about this in December because I began to talk to the mayor and the director of safety's office um, just a few weeks ago about what we can do more. I'm a part, as most of you know, of national groups like the major county sheriffs of America. And in knowing that across the country, there's an increase in fentanyl use, opioid use, meth use, it, uh, was something that I thought would be a great idea. So those discussions are just beginning to happen and the first one will happen next week. Great, excited about um, that moving forward. So thanks. Uh, Larry, I just saw your hand go up. I hit the wrong emoji. I was looking for the clap hands just because I'm glad to hear that that's happening. Oh, well, go ahead and hit it again, Larry. <laughs> just raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand and maybe yes, that'll be You want to do that. All right, thanks. Okay. Are there any other questions related to the MAP program? Okay, the last question or the last category is medical care and in custody death. Uh, question nine, in light of events we've previously discussed and the more recent events surrounding an in custody death, are you satisfied with the medical care being provided by Denver Health? Um, I cannot talk about the in custody death because that is under investigation. So I won't be able to answer any questions related to that, but Am I satisfied with the medical care being provided by Denver Health? Absolutely. I think overall Denver Health does a phenomenal job in the care that they provide. You know, currently we're booking about 60 people per day. That's about 21,000 people uh, through our system that are expected this year. Denver Health does a tremendous job in providing medical care to them. I've been in jails from border to border and coast to coast and know all of the healthcare providers uh, that work in different facilities. And I can tell you that Denver Health either can meet or beat those healthcare providers when it comes to overall coverage. I think the other benefit that we have with working with Denver Health is they're a community provider as well. So while they provide services in the jail, when folks go back to the community, uh, they have a continuity of services that's being provided to them. Uh, the 10th question is what steps are you taking to understand the recent death Obviously, I have reviewed the information, but it's currently under investigation by three separate groups who are sort of warning parallel and sometimes overlapping 
uh, investigations. The first is the uh, Public Integrity Division under the Department of Safety and the uh, Administrative Investigations Unit under them has started an investigation. The second one is the Denver Police Department it has started an investigation. The third is Denver Health has started their own internal independent investigation as well. And the 11th and last question is what will be done to ensure that inmates are being provided with a satisfactory level of care? I think we have uh, oversight by the National Commission on Correctional Health Care, who Denver Health and the Denver Sheriff's Department is accredited by, as well as the American Correctional Association, who recently awarded the Sheriff's Department and our overall operation to include Denver Health with uh, continued accreditation, but we also have those checks and balances and looking at uh, quality care by reviewing with Denver Health what's being done on a monthly basis. So I believe that we do have a satisfactory level of care. Uh, Julia, I see your hand is raised. Thanks, and, then Nikki. Um, and, and I know Nikki too. For those who are uh, maybe unfamiliar with what happened uh, with the re recent death in custody, I wonder if you could just go over um, from your perspective, you know, what happened there. Yes, uh, a gentleman by the name of Leroy Taylor was in our custody um, on uh, serving a sentence for uh, something that happened in 2015. And on February 9th, I believe it was, a medical emergency was called and subsequently uh, life-saving measures were performed by our staff, medical staff and paramedics. And he subsequently uh, passed away. Unfortunately, our hearts go out to the family of Mr. Taylor. Uh, the Man Love family is a, a family that is well known in Denver. The Taylor family is a family that's well known in Denver. So the, our hearts go out to them during this, this time and, and uh, just very sad that 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 has happened to someone that they love. Uh, Nikki? Oop. Am I? Okay, good, I'm unmuted. So it's my understanding based on recent news reporting that one of the questions being investigated is the role of the charge nurse in either facilitating or preventing medical treatment. And my recollection of that when Jessica Sanchez, no, I'm sorry, Diana Sanchez gave birth in a Denver jail cell, there was also a question about the role of the charge nurse in coordinating transport. Uh, so my question is what policies govern the behavior and the obligations of charge nurses? Are they solely DPD? Are they Denver Health? Is there crossover? Um, can we see them? And who provides oversight then um, for the behavior of the charge nurses? They're uh, a part of the Denver Health group. So their work is overseen by Denver Health. And other questions related to Denver Health policies and procedures, we'll be more than happy to connect you, to connect the group with Denver Health to have their policies and procedures submitted to uh, the COB. D, so deep, I'm sorry, the Sheriff's Department does not have any policies that govern their expectations of the charge nurses. Those exist solely from the Denver Health side. We have contract language that talks about the expectations that we have overall for the performance of Denver Health for, from a broad perspective. So it's not broken down into each category. They have lots of different practitioner groups that work inside of Denver Health. So we have a, an overall umbrella contract with Denver Health that talks about the expectation that we have for their work. Would you wanna see more policies from the Sheriff's Department side um, guiding that behavior? I believe the policies that we have in place are sufficient, but we're always up to reviewing them to see what can be done better. I think, you, I think Julia had to, oh, Julia's still with us. Sorry, we thought she was going to have to leave for up to 15 minutes, but she's still with us. Go ahead, Julia. You're meeting. Yeah, uh, my doctor just rescheduled on me, so um, okay. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll duck out during executive session. Um, so, yeah, there's just there's a there's a lot here. Um, you know, part of the reason we wanted to engage Denver Health in the 
conversation, right, is that the authority gets confusing and the responsibility, you know, like you're in charge of people in custody. And um, if people die in custody, that isn't necessarily because of actions you took that creates a really perilous environment, right? We, we have a accountability and authority sort of mismatch. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's worth a, another conversation with Denver Health. Um, you know, especially in COVID times, it, it surprises me, you know, we're two full years into this pandemic uh, that we should have a, a surprise you know, COVID related death in custody. Um, and it, it feels like there's a, a serious gap here in, um, in terms of, um, yeah, just like I said, the, the authority and the responsibility lining up. Um, any other questions from board members um, on this topic? When, uh, one question for me is when do you expect these investigations to wrap up or um, how are they going to be wrapped together if we've got three separate investigations, you know, who's got the uh, authority over the, you know, final decisions. We'll work together with all of the bodies to figure out uh, how we can ensure that there's a comprehensive review for each of the investigations. I can't tell you the uh, uh, or give you a timeline for those investigations. Those are being conducted by bodies outside of, of the sheriff's department. But we know that all of those groups are working expeditiously to make sure that they do a, a timely but thorough investigation as well. And will each organization have a review authority into the others invest, right? If, if Denver Health finds, you know, negligence or bad behavior on their part, will you know that? Um, you know, you have a contract with them and I think it benefits you from, from knowing if they're not following their own um, internal processes. So what, what's the crossover in, in information sharing that's gonna happen as a result there? Yeah, I as the sheriff do have the ability to uh, completely review their reports and all reports related to this, as does the Department of Safety. Uh, so we'll be making sure that all those groups uh, are, are, they will be reviewing all of those reports. Nikki? Which of those investigations will the OIM be a party to? Um, you'll have to ask Greg, I'm not sure. I've been told I'd only be able to look at- Greg, Greg, we can't hear you. I see your microphone is up. You might have to bring it down. <laughs> you are correct, sir. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay. Yep. Yeah. My understanding is that our office would only be able to see the administrative investigation performed by PID. Um, but uh, I welcome us being able to see all the information because, of course, there could be information that is useful to the administrative investigation. Um, that might be contained in the other investigations. And so I would definitely um, request that availability to see all the information that the department uh, has, as well as the sheriff's department, in order to have a better um, full picture of what happened. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'd suggest that you get access to all three reports. Death and custody is clearly one of the OIMs you know, areas of responsibility and making sure we've got full insight into this incident um, is important, not just to that person's family, but in terms of policy process and, and procedure. So um, happy to write a memo on, on, on that behalf if we need to, um, but the more we piece out information, the, the harder it is to, you know, track back to what the real root causes of this were, so. Other board member questions on this? Yeah, plus just follow up on that, Julia and Greg. I mean, if if Greg doesn't have all the information, he may think something wasn't done that perhaps was done or vice versa. I mean, so it really is important for him to get, get the full picture. Any okay. other questions? Go ahead. I was gonna ask. I had a clarifying question. Like, do, do we know? Uh, so, Mr. Taylor, um, he he was he just he was dead. He he died in the jail, or did he die in the hospital? 
Uh, Mr. Taylor was not declared dead here. Chris Gilbert says that does not answer the question. Mr. Mr. Gilbert, what I will say is when the determination was made that Mr. Taylor had passed away, that was done at the hospital. And again, I can't answer detailed questions about things because it is still a very active uh, investigation. So at some point in these investigations, it will be made clear what um, life signs were present uh, when the deputies found him in jail, whether he had a heartbeat, whether or not he was breathing. I, I think a lot of us understand that the declaration of death can be something of a technicality. Uh, again, Nikki, um, I'm uh, limited in what I can say in regards to this matter because of the investigations. Given the public interest in this case, has there been any commitment made on behalf of the Department of Safety to um, make a more robust set of findings available to the public when the investigations are completed? Um, I can't speak on behalf of the Department of Safety. What I can tell you is that uh, Director Saldalte and the Department of Safety are always interested in making sure that the public has um, as much in information as possible. Uh, Karen? Yeah, um, does the uh, Sheriff's Department have a tracking system that uh, notes the number of times that an inmate requests uh, medical attention and what the response is? Um, we don't have those metrics from the Sheriff's Department standpoint, Denver Health may keep those metrics and I can ask them if that's the case, if they keep those metrics. So in a case where an inmate request of, the, uh, of a deputy to see a uh, medical uh, personnel, that report goes to Denver Health and then they respond back or how does that work? No, we don't keep metrics on when deputies ask for uh, inmates to be seen by medical. That's not a metric that we keep. I believe Denver Health has metrics based on the number of times that they actually see folks. I see there are questions in the chat. I see, um, I'll back up. I believe Jeremy Hohola from Nine News has asked a question. There's been reporting a charge nurse has been placed on leave in this case. I'm not sure if I can ask as an observer but I figured I put this on the table. Jeremy, you will have to contact uh, Denver Health for a response to that question. Nikki wrote, Jeremy, is your request to confirm whether a charge nurse has, has been placed on leave? Jeremy wrote, yes, Nikki, thank you. And Nikki, we always welcome community questions and participation. Jeremy wrote, thank you, Sheriff, for addressing my question. And you're welcome, Jeremy. Okay, uh, any other community member questions? You're welcome to put them into either the Q&A or the chat. Um, we'll keep Sheriff Diggins live for a few more minutes in case you have those. Um, so we'll just have a nice pregnant pause here to fill it with some music while people uh, feel brave to, to ask their questions. From Chris Gilbert, can the community expect there to be a criminal investigation into the Taylor death? Uh, Chris, the Denver Police Department is conducting an investigation. And so they'll determine uh, which direction that goes in. Chris Gilbert, something greater than the DPD homicide investigation. I'm not sure if that's a question, but again, the Denver Police Department um, is responsible for criminal investigations inside the city and county of Denver. So they would determine if that was the case. 
or if, if an, an investigation of that nature is, is to be done along those lines. Um, Daniel, can you remind uh, us when we next meet with the sheriff um, so we may follow up on our questions? Yes, our next scheduled meeting is uh, in May, okay. so Friday, May 20th. All right, so depending on how this investigation is proceeding, we may ask you to come back a little sooner um, if possible. So uh, more to come on that. Um, if there are, oh, there is one question in the Q&A. Um, uh, a different line of questioning, but um, maybe we'll go there. A uh, question from the community. Uh, what is the percent upcharge on commissary items and are phone calls with families to the jail free? Um, so two separate questions. So our uh, commissary providers are required to do a comparative analysis with uh, convenience stores within a uh, five mile radius, I believe it is, of our facilities to ensure that our prices stay uh, at or about the same prices as those in the community. It's one of the things that we as an agency and I personally ensure occurs. Phone calls are not free from the jail. There are times when we offer free phone calls when someone comes into our intake area, those phone calls are free but generally those phone calls uh, are not free in the past. But here's what I can tell you. The Denver Sheriff's Department has the lowest rate for phone calls in the metro area. And I've been involved with this conversation with the FCC and on a national scale for a very long time. We purposefully ensure that our provider Securus has the lowest rates possible, which currently are 0 0.08 cents per minute. Uh, for in-state calls and 0 0.09 cents per minute for out-of-state calls, which is well below the rate that the FCC has stated, which is 21 cents per minute, and other jurisdictions around the metro area have higher rates as well. So we have the lowest rates when it comes to those phone calls and also ensure that we're making uh, the prices for our commissary as low as possible as well. Okay, thank you for that. Um, let me see if there's anything in the chat. I think we're good. Um, so Sheriff, thank you for your time today. Uh, lots of uh, media discussion topics, lots of uh, things happening in your um, area of responsibility. So appreciate the time um, and uh, we look forward to continuing the dialogue on these matters with you. Thank you. Thank you all for your support and the questions. Love to have great dialogue. So we'll see you next time. All right, sounds good, thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Um, and if there are no other um, areas of business we need to cover, I will um, adjourn us to executive session. Thank you, see you there. <laughs>